paradigm shift in uh, inflation in terms of interest rates should help us to uh, looking at credit growth etc this 13% has got decent collateral cover as well we also have made significant impairments like i said it's almost a trillion at the beginning of the year we predicted this to be as bad as 15 plus percentage banking act the new one is at the consultative level uh, central bank the stakeholders are talking about how to improve uh, what is being shared with the banks as per the new banking act <clears throat> there will be restrictions placed on us with regard to the Uh, lending to the SOEs. There has to be a sort of a mindset shift that uh, that will have to happen, because it will have to happen from the furthest branch and to the head office. Hello, you're with Echelon's Turning Point, and we're discussing risk and regulation, managing operational risk, and the evolving regulatory landscape in banking. And we certainly have a very heavyweight panel with us today. Between the three of them, they probably control 50% of Sri Lanka's banking sector assets. And and the first person on the panel today is Sanat Maratunga, who is chief executive of Commercial Bank. Then we have Clive Fonseca, who is chief executive of People's Bank, and we also have Jonathan Alas, who is chief executive of HNB. Sanat, Clive, Jonathan, thank you for joining Echelon. Let let's start here, right? It looks like Sri Lanka's economy now has bottomed out. We are looking for economic growth and also for for a revival in all activity. When you look at where we've been i'll start with you sanat and when we we looked looked at where look at where we've been and what your expectations are for 2024 onwards how does that change priorities for banking you know versus what has been to what you expect uh, thanks uh, shan uh, for banking sector or any business uh, the priorities depend on the context so if you look at the context which we were in last year interest rates were very high inflation was high then economic stability was in question and uh, the imf uh, the negotiations were at a very uh, infancy stage so today we have uh, a visibility in what we do so i would say context has changed so then the banks should change the course uh, their risk appetite should change and also look at the economy with empathy uh, the especially the the players in the economy because we have gone through hardships from 2019 uh, the easter sunday attack then the covid then the socio economic unrest so as banks we have suffered uh, a lot then our customers have suffered a lot so now the time is time for the banks to think about uh, uh, how to support our customers support the economy in the positive context of these changes how the interest rates are at a uh, level uh, about half what we had last year the exchange uh, availability of exchange is there uh, last year banks were uh, struggling to have exchange uh, the the foreign currency to support imports the inflation although from a, a higher uh, base the inflation has settled down to below 5% so in that context i think uh, the risk appetite how we look at uh, growth Uh, has already already been changed in bank in sector then uh, as bank we need to see what sectors need our help we have to prioritize let's say smes and uh, our economy went through these issues because of uh, maybe not prioritizing exports not uh, giving sufficient uh, attention to uh, manufacturers locally who can manufacture import substitutes then renewable energy so things like that can be prioritized and also uh, industry like tourism they suffered a lot from 2019 at the moment tourism is booming so we need to change our attitude the the outlook for these industries and support and in next year even construction should be looked at favorably industry like tourism construction will add value to the the lowest level in the economy so that it is a good uh, uh, maybe a way of reviving the economy 
and uh, we have set the context so it's up to the bank to plan uh, for 2024 in a very positive manner sure uh, clive so sanat lays out for us how fundamentally the context has changed from what it was uh, to today right you had a very large balance sheet uh, state controlled bank right your your context was slightly different to the past uh, to to private sector banks right how has that changed for you what are your new priorities you think in 2024 as per the new banking act <clears throat> there will be restrictions placed on us with regard to the uh, lending to the soes uh, in fact uh, due to the cost uh, plus uh, pricing of the utilities like uh, electricity water the requirement for funding from the state banks will also be less so uh, going forward we also are gearing ourselves to lend to the private sector corporates smes because we have 747 branches we have 14.5 million customers then a lot, whole lot of sme customers are working with us then even for retail so that's uh, where our priorities lies in the so it'll be sort of a business change i mean so so if you put that into a percentage clive uh, you know what percentage of your book was soe or state controlled ventures in the past and what do you anticipate will happen you know if you put it in percentages it used to be about 52 to 53 percent for us now that is lending to the state so soe uh, loans to the other uh, loans and advances right now it's about 44 percent so we expect uh, this to reduce to less than 40% by around February because a lot of repayments are happening, uh, especially from the SOEs. Then uh, along with that, there is a proposal to uh, restructure CPC's debt from uh, CPC to Ministry of Finance. So that will have a huge impact on the SOE uh, component because there will be a drastic reduction there. Uh, so, Jonathan, uh, these two gentlemen have now covered the broad thing. I think what's left to you is regulation and stuff like that also. And it looks like there's going to be a lot of liquidity in 2024 if we are going to go by what Clive is saying. Again, same question to you. From where you are sitting, uh, how do you think the context for 2024 and beyond is changing for the industry and for what you're doing? So firstly, thank you for having me, Shamin, and some great uh, openings from Sanat and uh, Clive makes life uh, easy for me. So yes, uh, uh, paradigm shift in uh, inflation in terms of interest rates should help us to, uh, you know, start do, uh, you know, uh, looking at credit growth, etc. Need to be conscious of the stage three, which is, you know, significant at 13% or at about, uh, you know, one and a half uh, trillion on a 11 trillion, uh, you know, banking industry balance sheet. Impairments are touching almost a trillion as well. So we need to be uh, uh, working hard in parallel uh, to, uh, you know, revive these customers, encourage them and the whole, uh, May a government mechanism, the regulator, the government, uh, all of us must work together to encourage people to repay. Because you spoke of liquidity, that repayment actually brings in, uh, uh, you know, further liquidity. If there is less government borrowing, SOE borrowing, that brings in liquidity. That then allows us to channel these funds into the right areas, also keeping interest rates relatively uh, low. And that's a very useful thing. So this should go hand in hand. It's not sequential, it's in parallel, where we work hard on our recoveries to support tourism, uh, revive, uh, you know, construction, revive some of the other industries, and look at new areas to growth in particular. We need to look at some of the areas that we kept mentioning in the past as being important, like, you know, are we really looking at import substitution? Are we trying to drive manufacturing? Uh, you know, are we driving our exporters? Yes, there is risk Session. Yes, there is global uh, almost depression, but we need to find our sweet spots, right? We are a small country, a small economy, $1 billion exports to move it. Uh, 
5-10% is not something that will affect the global uh, uh, landscape too uh, significantly. So we need to, and entrepreneurship is at the heart of it because we'll get our top corporates to diversify. But a lot is to help our SMEs and some of our other young uh, uh, thinkers, our fintechs and all that is to start, you know, helping them uh, to start doing some business. It's not as if all of us should, you know, grow up doing our O-levels and A-levels uh, the children growing up and going into companies and trying to sort of work we must get into our curriculums the idea of entrepreneurship business and our whole infrastructure financial landscape regulatory landscape should support the growth of uh, uh, entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka and give them that uh, you know entrepreneurial spirit and that you know risk taking uh, uh, ability and that's the kind of support structure we need to uh, build in. so so i'll pick up on something you said jonathan and maybe we can all talk about this right you talked about how the condition of your balance sheet currently obviously you have liquidity but you have also so called stage in stage 3 that is non performing loans right you have uh, in the industry about a billion and a half trillion and a half out of a total asset base in the industry of about 11 trillion, 10 to 11 trillion, right? 13%, that's a significant number. It's surely this must be taking a lot of your bandwidth as a CEO, right? What do you anticipate uh, the industry can do about this? 13% is a large number. We are used to having 3%, right? So I am hopeful and I think my colleagues will uh, probably uh, agree with me that we may have, maybe we have seen the uh, bottom of this and then you will see towards the year end this 13% reducing and also we have got decent uh, two important aspects. This 13% has got decent collateral cover as well and with that uh, we also have made significant impairments like I said it's almost a trillion. So, and in the stage three, we have done more than a 50% in terms of coverage. So, in terms of bank uh, stability and, uh, you know, our ability to, to withstand, we have taken the hit already over the last two, three years. Now, what we see is uh, the need for us to stay honest with these customers, continue to work closely with them and get them through that final hurdle and get them, you know, revived. Now they are generating enough cash flow, some to pay interest, some to pay a little bit of principal. Be patient with them. Those who are, you know, staying honest, those who are really working hard to, you know, uh, make things happen uh, and help them. And we can see this ratio reducing uh, quite significantly. What is important is how we actually treat the willful defaulters and those who actually can pay and who actually uh, uh, avoid paying. Yesterday's papers spoke about uh, the credit authority that is going to be formed for responsible lending. I welcome that fully, but equally there must be a credit authority for responsible uh, repaying. Nobody talks too much about repaying. It's just left to the banks and to the individuals who lend to actually repay. We need to strengthen repayment you know the legal system and whether it's uh, you know the various infrastructure available whether it's the uh, uh, you know arbitration mediations all those need to be strengthened insolvency laws need to be strengthened so that people will see a greater requirement to keep repaying and continuing to perform in the industry. Sanat, I'll bring you in and, and as CEO currently, if you look at how you're spending your time, yeah. right? I am from the outside, I'm thinking, okay, you must be spending a significant amount of your bandwidth managing the balance sheet clearly uh, and also a significant amount of time trying to see what you do with this 13% NPL. That's the yeah. industry-wide NPL, right? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, actually, uh, I'll take a cue from Jonathan. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we predicted this to be as bad as 15 plus percentage. But uh, we have seen a plateauing trend for the last uh, four or five months with the interest rate reducing and also uh, economy reviving to some extent. Uh, we have seen the pressure on the loan book has reduced. 
so there's a good news that the uh, the ability for repayment is uh, better than what we expected uh, last year second thing is as jonathan said uh, the banks don't want to go on the foreclosure unless there's a willful default because foreclosure is not going to help the borrower bank or the economy right we have a lot of foreclosed properties uh, 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 liquidation is a problem so because of that always as i mentioned the word empathy the banks are supportive if the customers come early okay impairment is a pnl side of it but we can if we can support the customer to revive one day we can reverse this so that is the attitude the bank industry is having so always if the customer uh, comes forward and tell about their difficulties early the banks uh, banks are able to help but unfortunately some of the especially the smes go through uh, you know going to high uh, cost of bar- uh, cost borrowings sometimes informal money lenders and they get into trouble that's why they need to have this uh, approach like a partner you have to go to the bank explain the situation so then we have resolutions because we have dealt with many customers and gone through many scenarios and we should be able to guide especially the smes uh, who who don't uh, uh, have uh, maybe a, a in depth knowledge on how to go through a restructuring so that side of it can be tackled very easily if they come forward then tell their uh, because we went through moratorium we rescheduled some of the delay when we see uh, when uh, regional facilities are getting delayed we gave more uh, time for these uh, the industries to pay so tolerance levels are there we have gone through a lot and we we tolerate that but the thing is always you have to have that partnership mindset bankers and also the customers then it's easier to get through the challenges right uh- Clive, uh, I'm thinking your challenges are slightly different. Now you're talking about growing your book to SMEs and retail customers, right? Uh, versus what you've had in the past. Um, uh, but is is managing the repayments from state, from the state, you know, which you said you were at 52% of your book had been lent to state or state-controlled uh, institutions, uh, to making this transition the one that's taking up all your time and bandwidth these days. How is it for you? Uh, we speak to them daily and uh, we speak to the uh, Ministry of Finance and the entities, different entities. So, I mean, we know that uh, there will not be any sort of new requirements from them. so that we are very clear and as far as the sme customers and our corporates are concerned we have successfully uh, i mean we, are, we have have this program of a rehabilitation unit so that has been a huge success and there are many success stories where you know i mean we restructured we rescheduled and we sometimes extended the tenors and those have got to performing stage because of the uh, early uh, sort of uh, action that the borrower and the bank took uh jonathan i'll bring you in so uh in this context the regulatory landscape is also seeing several changes i think predominantly because you will have soon uh, a new banking act right uh what will this change for your industry and for your business uh, you know it's come in 2024 so it's i mean extremely exciting at uh, times i'm sad kind of i'm kind of winding down at this stage i wish some of this came and i used to tell them that it came about 10 years back would have been very useful so uh, two three big areas in terms of you know having better governance you know better screening of the people that you're going to get on to your boards and in, as your key management person uh, uh, in office to your corporate management team so makes lens for stronger boards stronger uh, management more independence uh, and uh, uh, it was there even in the imf uh, governance diagnostic study beautifully laid out in terms of you know the the to dos and uh, the not to dos which is if we just follow some of it it will be uh, very useful so uh, that is one aspect of it then you're going to see uh, t- significant changes in the single borrower limit and also strengthening of the related party you know clear identification broadening of the definition which also then means that 
uh, we would need to contract some of our lending and our concentration risks will reduce. And whilst there is liquidity in the industry, it just compels us in a very nice way and a positive way to spread our risk, to diversify and accommodate further industries. And this really helps us to then start looking at SME, emerging corporates, the microfinance and, you know, doing better uh, kind of uh, digital lending and uh, stuff like that. And it also encourages corporates who have got big exposures to diversify their capital structures instead of only sort of leveraging themselves and then seeing themselves over leveraged growing if their growth over the past decade is propelled by uh, leverage today they must be finding it difficult with the interest rates going all over the place right uh, so they now will see the importance of bringing in equity, knowing that there's only so much that they could uh, uh, borrow from companies. People, uh, corporates will start looking to borrow from overseas. They'll be looking to actually uh, list their companies more and bring, there'll be more stock market activity. There will be more international participation in our stock market, given uh, greater participation of the local entities. So I think all these lenders itself beautifully into uh, you know some of the banks concentrating on looking at investment banking commercial banking SME banking development banking getting a little more structured and segmented so that you really focus on your niches and start playing to those areas while corporates look to sort of deleverage themselves and reduce the risks in uh, reviving themselves. Uh, Clive, it's no secret that uh, the government and the CPC and the CEB are two of your biggest customers. Now there is the new act that will bring limitations on you know how much you can lend to any single party. Does the act uh, make exceptions for the government entities? No. Right. So it will be the single borrow limit will be applicable for the SOEs also. Right. So, so uh, good, good thing is they have given a uh, time period. If I remember right, that's about two or three years. So for them to uh, bring the exposure to the SBL limit. So we have already ha ha are having discussions actually. Uh, I can tell you one or two entities, uh, they are fully committed because uh, we've seen the cash flows, projected cash flows from that. We are confident that they can actually come to the SBL uh, in less than uh, that uh, period that, that is provided by the central bank. So it, it looks like uh, then these opportunities to lend to these institutions will also open right. to the sector in general. Uh, yeah, uh, let me add uh, now, first thing is, uh, Banking Act, the new one is at the consultative level. Uh, central bank, the stakeholders are talking about how to improve uh, what is being shared with the banks. Especially, uh, there was a regulation which was put forward by CSC uh, on listing rules uh, around governance also. There could be certain contradiction with the Banking Act. So this consultative paper will take all this into account as Jonathan said. Mainly the governance and resilience is what is expected. And uh, this might push uh, banking sector consolidation, in my personal opinion, because if you see the top five banks in the country controls about so more than 75% of the assets. So this is not uh, a good uh, thing for our industry where uh, we have 20 plus banks. So here with the single barrel limitations, ownership limitations, uh, and also central bank is uh, promoting consolidation so that will happen and it will create a more resilient robust uh, financial system and already the banking special provision 17 uh, which was uh, gazetted in this year that talks a, a lot about the the creating the resilience in the banking ecosystem including payment and settlement the banking uh, it talks about uh, how to uh, handle a uh, stress situation in a bank or in the sector. So th those things will uh, add more resilience and robustness for the entire industry and the ecosystem where the financial uh, sector and the systems will uh, have a huge impact on the economy. So the central bank is taking uh, these, uh, these uh, proactive measures to create this robustness so that uh, even during the worst periods, none of the banks uh, went bad. So that's a good thing. But you can't take a chance. So I think with the Banking Act, uh, which will come next year, and with this uh, special provisioning and also the 
direction 16 on technology resilience i think uh, we will uh, this, the regulator will create lot of uh, confidence in the sector and with the consolidation it will be uh, more maybe bigger banks to even go into the regions kind of thing i pers- uh, maybe foresee in the next 5 years uh consolidation has been talked about for a long time but it it hasn't you know th- there hasn't been a genuine attempt i think there's maybe been one or two right at all, if at all and those haven't also come to anything uh some say this is because the banks leaderships aren't willing to do this you know wh- you know what's your view on that uh it's uh, more than willingness uh, i think uh, there should be uh, some commitment from the shareholders to the own, uh, the the management to look at the industry and look at the organizations uh it's, it should not be protecting their personal domain or the maybe domain as a bank or a institution but uh, for me the the leadership in the banks will support regulator also has a role to play and uh, uh, certain things like capital Uh, support from maybe uh, institutions like world bank adb and technical uh, consultation or technical expertise from uh, international bodies will help the local banking industry to go through this part because we have never done a big consolidation so i think none of us are very confident how sure. this is going to sure. turn out yeah so okay. so it's it's certainly not to make small of it because consolidations are you know about cultures about you know it's not about putting just two balance sheets together right but at the end of the day you can jonathan go to shareholders and say this will create more value for you right because a larger bank is lower cost to run right uh, uh, is that conversation something that you will think you can have in 2024 and onwards so we've been having this conversation for the past many years we've been talking to banks as well as our shareholders on a regular basis many papers have been put to the board in terms of our interest in uh, basically uh, consolidating has been kind of known uh, and uh, now with the new banking act the potential changes in the single borrower once it's uh, uh, finalized and your capacity ability to lend to these corporates being uh, uh, you know somewhat uh, impaired or reduced we have to start looking at larger uh, capitalized banks which can go into the region we need to start playing that role uh, as well and uh, knowing that we have a huge role to play for our country so we should be able to sell the story yes there are challenges integrating systems you know uh, close rationalizing branches and staff and all that but it's also a good thing at a time when the banking industry is losing so much of its staff going overseas etc right that uh, this kind of thing uh, happens and with the level of digitalization automation rpas ai work that we are doing you do not need the number of branches and the uh, self service machines that we have spread across the country with moving our clients to mobile banking and digital banking so all of it banking act digitalization the ability to reach us the staff challenges balance sheet constraints all that lends itself beautifully to and the regulator support is there in no uncertain terms to actually at this time for the banks to get together and look for some uh, partners and do it on a voluntary basis and to that actually uh, one thing is the talent talent attrition is a uh, challenge now and other thing is if you see in a locality you have let's say 10 banks right all will have atms the maintainers if we put a digital platform all 10 banks will pay a foreign vendor some amount actually we are bleeding dollars to overseas but if those are about two three big banks then there's lot of uh, you know the scale where we can reduce the cost and we can even develop our own technology software so we can invest in this so that will be a investment for the future as a industry and uh, the the money will be in the country 
and our talent can grow and on we'll that. be retaining our it talent because they'll see a huge uh, scope and oh. we are investing in our people in sri lanka as opposed to bringing for inman like import substitution is not just for the goods and services you know that we consume but even the very things that we do we need to look at our local uh, one of the conversations you will be having with shareholders is your ability to get to give them a decent return you know return on equity right um, that has possibly been very challenging in the last few years but your shareholders are not going to be patient forever yeah right uh, how do you fix this is consolidation a big ticket to fix this if not you know it's there's only so much time they will give you yeah. sanat uh, before you know they become fairly impatient so uh, to answer that the the short term challenge the industry is facing is now we went through the sldb restructuring in a very positive manner is isb restructuring is the big hurdle we had to go through we have lent to the government we are take going to take haircuts that impact should be minimized for the sector not from a shareholder point of view if we are to support the economy the bank should retain this money which is given to the government because ultimately already all the banks have got almost 45 50% haircut provisioning on this so this is a, a kind of a bad debt yes. so if the banking sector two things one thing is if the banking local banks can get part of this money in rupees like sldbs it will create lot of confidence in the sector shareholders will be happy when we go to the market next year let's say a bank goes to the market to raise capital we have a story to tell that the government the regulator looked after us we are on a growth uh, trajectory support us with capital so capital is even needed for consolidation second thing still we have not got the 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 taxation on this cleared so if we have to have a haircut and our profit is taxed it's a double whammy which we are going to fight but as a industry we are not talking of individual banks if the industry get weaken let's say a bank its capital is uh, minus 1 billion that means 10 billion going to the economy by way of loan is reduced then you can't support the economy and also as a sector if you go, go to the share market as a sector we are not the most valuable maybe the banking sector is not the most valued share all the banks are around 0.5 to 0.6 of the book value so that means the investors are reluctant so they have an issue with this industry how this will turn out to be so those the 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 isb restructuring is the single largest short to medium term Uh, issue the industry is having i hope as an industry we are lobbying the regulator government everybody even the outside creditors should uh, think it uh, in a more wise manner uh, and support us uh, j- just to yeah. get a sense a background uh, of outstanding commercial loans by the government the so called isbs uh, the sri lankan banks uh, hold about uh, how much roughly about 1.25 billion dollars right out of maybe 1.8 in total i think the sri lankan component is about 1.8 billion right that yeah. is uh, in sri lanka but the banks in have sri- about 1.1 Two five billion, two, okay. five, right? Okay. So that is out of a total outstanding uh, of about twelve billion. Twelve point five billion, yes. Twelve yes. billion plus, right? Uh, so J- Jonathan Sanat is suggesting that you know uh, the case of the Sri Lankan banks should be looked at in a slight exception when these uh, uh, when the f- final agreements on restructuring this debt is arrived at. You know what's what's your input? What, what, what so we talk of a level playing field and we. fully rep- uh, appreciate that and mm. respect the agreements that are in place but just think about that international creditor who is looking at a new bond a restructured bond post haircut they are dependent on the economy taking off in order to get their repayments and their coupons on the new bond and the value of that new bond but if the biggest catalyst the who will drive this economy which is the banking industry is not stable is not strong and is not in a position to support that then they are actually not helping uh, themselves so to that end 
also you need to take the full picture when you are doing this calculation i think you can't just take a silo as in an isb and say level playing field everybody takes the same you need to see what the banking industry has taken over the last uh, uh, so many years in having these bonds with us and supporting the economy having a one and a half trillion uh, uh, you know stage three uh, credit portfolio all cost we can talk of covid we can talk but basically it's an economic crisis and it's an economic crisis propelled by poor government poor governance bad leadership right so we have got to take the brunt of it it's not that all these bad debts are a cause of people not doing their business properly right so the whether you are a bilateral creditor or a bond creditor overseas you need to know that the predicament that we are in it's not an isolated isb transaction we have got multiple factors you take all those together we have taken our fair share uh, of hit already and that's where people need to be a little more understanding and give us a chance to you know play our role to revive this economy and show what is, we can do is there precedence for what you're suggesting that you know some part of the haircut be compensated with uh, a rupee instrument uh, so uh, sldb is the the yeah. example yeah. plus yeah. i think yeah. internationally, internationally there have, have been, been uh, yes. a few bonds yeah. which have actually got In restructured some other countries yeah. because these these bond holders i mean surely they will want as a principle everybody to be treated equally and fairly right uh, uh, fairly think, yes yeah. but equally is uh, different as jonathan said the banking sector in sri lanka has a role to play our risk profile is different to them and these are weak argument but if you see the banking sector invested at par but some of the creditors would have bought it at cheaper prices right it's a weak argument from a investor point of view but you have to think whether the in what context the banks had to invest and in what context they bought the bonds so i am directly saying because i am talking on behalf of the industry and also as jonathan said Some we have gone through it's lar yeah. for them it's a, it's a evaluated investment, investment decision, decision decision they may lar is what li- i'm sorry it's a liquid asset at- ratio at- for at- which we need to keep 20% of our uh, you know as uh, assets in a liquid form and this is one of the liquid instruments we market foreign currency heavily nrfcs and there was no avenue to park it in terms of loans etc so you parked it in so, isbs, ISBs and sldbs so. and this is what we give in order to give confidence to our depositors by the way your deposits are secure because we have put more than this percentage there and when that gets haircut what kind of confidence do we give our depositors so our, our responsibility compared to creditors is huge one thing these depositors money we can't create any uh, any shake in the industry second thing we have to support the economy to grow third thing we should not uh, neglect the technology investment digitalization so many things to be invested so unless we invest today we will be already we, are, we may be behind in digital adaptation so those things are for the country for the economy and also always if, although we say bank banks banks this depositors shareholders borrowers we are in between <laughs> Uh, Clive, I didn't bring you in on the ISBs because People's Bank has virtually no exposure to ISBs. But, uh, but you know, when you look forward from where you are, and we are slightly changing gear here, right? You've got to now build an institutional capacity within People's Bank to to grow your book because you you've been able to park. you know you raise deposits you park it in government at least 52% of your you know assets were government uh this transformation is not going to be straightforward or easy for you Th- is this the biggest thing that you are looking at right now in a challenge you're right because there has to be a sort of a mindset shift okay. that uh, that will have to happen because it will have to happen from the furthest branch and to the head office so everybody has to be geared Uh, as to basically uh, 
take advantage of this uh, latest uh, phenomenon so i mean you will have to i mean uh, even branch itself credit evaluation then it has it will go to the regions we have 25 regions all over the country then the head office so even the capacity building will have will also have to happen at the same time so that is the main challenge that we are having so it's sort of a he would uh, anticipate we are anticipating huge business shift so that's going to be uh, that's our main challenge uh, going forward for next year uh, from where you are what do you think is the biggest risk not necessarily in terms of this transformation obviously you can see that you need to do it <coughs> right it's a matter of now execution but there are risks that you know you can't fully be prepared for if you if you look at the sri lankan outlook sri lankan economy its governance its politics you know jonathan alluded to some of these for you what is the biggest risk the ones that you can't control but have to respond to see for me the biggest risk would be the volatility you know i mean exchange rates and the interest rates there again i would see the interest rate volatility is uh, is a bigger risk than the exchange rates for us for a bank because banks we have no pe limits uh, we buy and sell within that uh, so we will not get impacted hugely but in because you know if you if you are to take about retail retail loans uh, quite a substantial uh, loans and uh, advances are parked there so most of these retail loans on fixed rates so we have seen interest rates going from single digits to 30% so if uh, so it's in everybody's interest uh, if the interest rates are maintained uh, within a sort of a reasonable i wouldn't say that uh, maybe 5 6% or single digits may not be sort of the most optimum uh, rate so probably even is up to i mean 2 to 4% band or i think that is acceptable so that is uh, doable for us right jonathan from where you are sitting you know you must be thinking about those uh, risks that may arise but not not ones that you can directly control you know what do you think sri lanka's biggest such risks are that can still impact your industry so for me the people risk is a real risk in right. terms of you know us kind of telling our youngsters leave and go there's nothing else for you here and then but part of them should come be coming to the banking industry and they're not coming anymore where do i get my staff what is my next 5 years staffing strategy recruitment strategy and what kind of portfolio of staff do i maintain in some way i need to be conscious of my operating risk given the environment we need to height have need, need to raise the security levels whether it's on technology whether it's information security whether it's cyber security or just plain security we have seen heightened you know uh, the need to sort of uh, have greater awareness uh, uh, amongst us the uh, credit risk is a major risk that we need to be careful because it's not as sanat started off by saying we need to broad base we need to diversify we, we need to go into new areas and we can't shy away from our responsibility and doing just triple a lending or you know a uh, double a plus lending that's our role really as financial media intermediaries to take those deposits and shareholders money and really make the economy work and to spread it across and not you know limit it to 10 and the regulations that are coming in kind of uh, support it what we need is political stability economic stability policy consistency i mean why we are in this state is because in the absence of it you have these huge peaks and troughs now how do you do three year strategic plans and go with us uh, you know straight face to a board when you can't see six months ahead people ask what's the year end exchange rate or interest rate it's something that you don't want to even take a, a guess at you need to have uh, you know one day when it's 30% you're not supposed to lend next day in 6 months time it comes down to uh, 13% now you've got to immediately overnight start lending don't forget now i've already ramped up my F- fixed deposits at 20 30% uh, which are still there priced at that way. so you have to run a business and you have to sort of play the margin game so managing that balance sheet in a situation like this 
is quite challenging and being able to, whilst we know we need to manage our capital, we need to go overseas, we need to get leaner and meaner, we need to automate, we need to digitalize, we need to increase the knowledge and capacities of our staff and we are fully cognizant of our responsibilities and we'll do that. A little bit of help from the environment and the macro environment and the fiscal side as well will help you know and then broad basing our tax and collecting tax from others instead of only hammering the banking industry is something that will help as well uh sanat uh, same question to you i'm i'm sure you sleep well but if you know probably probably you know if something keeps you up at night you know what would it be yeah so as jonathan said policy consistency right. and connected to the volatilities volatilities uh, Clive was talking about we should not celebrate early okay For last six months we are recovering we are better than what I may have predicted but world over there are examples where you celebrate early but unless the policy consistency and seriousness is there you can go into a worse cycle so we should prevent that so to prevent that, there should be ownership of these decisions, governance around that. It should not be for some political or other gain. Now there will be election next year. So we should not go off course for short term gains at the cost of the economy. If you see the countries who have thrived, including in India, one thing is they had policy consistency respective of the political changes. We didn't have. We always change policies. We go offline with the IMFO, the, the financial disciplines. We, we compromise money for votes. We just give free money. And that there also there's no transparency in how the tax money is spent. spent. So there are a lot of things at policy level we have to fix and we have to be seriously consistent. If you have that, we can celebrate for a long time. For the, this is a, it's a great uh, context, great way to put it. Uh, for the long, now, now for instance, people are complaining about the high levels of taxation, right? Individuals feel it, you know, income earners now feel it uh, with both income taxes and that. But high taxation is something you have been living with for a long time. Do you think now is the time to start thinking about changing that? We are late to think. Now, as bankers, the banks are paying one of the highest tax rates, are over 55%. Uh, as employees, we had been paying pay tax for a long time. And if you see the economic crisis started with the fiscal deficit created by not collecting taxes from 2019, so we had been telling all the governments, the institutions to increase the tax net. Don't whack the people who are paying taxes. They have a they have a limit, right? And also when the economy is shrunk, if you tax the same people, anyway, the, the share will be less. So there are so many ways in other countries, they tax people. One is there's a good suggestion in the budget. If you are to open an account, you have to have a tax file. It's fair enough. So you, you declare your income. Account. Yes. Second thing, there are a lot of proxies. We have been telling the regulators. Petrol is pumped with the QR code. It's recorded. RMB has the vehicle details. CB will have the electricity bill. You can't pay an electricity bill of 50,000 if you're earning is 60,000. Right? So there are so many simple ways to increase the tax net within few months. It should happen. Right, already late. Other thing is, if inland revenue, uh, customs, or any other revenue collecting authority need collection accounts to be digitally enabled through the banks, all the banks will support. It's a few months affair. When the vehicles were imported with permits, the customs, RME banks were connected. When the LC has amended, it said the customs. It's not rocket science. It's the willingness. There should be a willingness from the top. And if you don't collect the taxes, the country will go through the same cycle. Second thing is, as I mentioned earlier, there should be transparency and responsibility in spending the taxation. 
you can collect but if you are just you know spending that without any responsibility without prioritizing that sectors then uh, the, it's like a hole in the bucket Uh, Jonathan what can the banks do in particular to help the government widen this tax net is it realistic now they seem to have an expectation of the bank to support the widening of the income tax net so we were a bit concerned firstly because of our customer confidentiality uh, that we have and we are not we are not uh, supposed to divulge information pertaining to our customer but then you know this is a regulatory body and if they ask for information we just cannot avoid uh, you know making that available and now the budget it tells itself says to open a current account you need to have to you know that's one way the other sanat has already said there are many whether it's a utility bill your telephone bills your electricity bills your cars your houses that you buy those have got to be uh, you know used then all government payments can actually be uh, digitized there is also we also want to digitalize the country right there's a big cash uh, economy that goes out uh, that's happening outside right there are people that even you know we engage you know and we don't realize that maybe what i pay is let's say 5000 rupees but he gets that money from 10 people during the day that's 50000 into a 30 is 1 and 1/2 million and that money is not anywhere is sort of say so we have to find a way of getting some of these transfers a it reduces the cash in circulation b it actually gets all these recorded in the banking industry and it's available for our taxers so even to help let's say uh uh let uh, smes now if you can actually encourage sme in our big plays smes microfinance etc to help them we can actually make it a condition that they actually produce accounts and start paying tax right if that is part of it we can let's say give a interest or we can make some of these low cost funds that are made available from the adbs and others channel towards these uh, segments so that you know they all start paying taxes instead of just showing accounts banks should stop lending against management accounts right not for a short time of 3 months or whatever but on a regular basis if you don't get audited accounts maybe you should uh, uh, stop Uh, lending small changes like that will encourage everybody to come in to have a producing proper accounts paying their taxes and everybody playing their part in the economy and not just leaving it to a, a handful and a few other points to add to that we should start with a digital id if india can have billion plus digital ids it's a matter of few months or one year let's say we can have digital ids so everything is connected in other developed countries everybody pays taxes right it's automatically done it's a duty and they are not worried because they will not say he is not paying why should i pay so that kind of under, uh, you know mentality is there in sri lanka and also in those countries it's a criminal fraud if you don't pay taxes even celebrities the sports stars they are caught in this by having plus or minus some tax uh, payment deficit so that culture should be created so if you can digitally connect as uh, jonathan told digitally connect now india qr payments are going viral the even smaller payments are qr so if you digitalize everybody will be paying then there's no complaint that he is not paying i am paying i don't think so that culture should be built again there should be uh, some initiative from the top and uh, stick to that uh clive uh, this expectation that banks help widen the tax net from where you are you have a large retail customer base uh, uh, does that apply to you how realistic is that see it applies for all the banks uh, people's bank is one example see as far as banks are concerned i think we have the systems in place uh, like uh, these two gentlemen said it's the uh, tone uh, that has to come from the top right and uh, and it's a seems- big way that we can help yeah. is where we started the conversation we help ps uh, our customers we help them grow they make more profits they pay more taxes is a sure way that's probably the primary way in which uh, uh, the banking sector should focus in the next 2 3 years in helping uh, the government build the uh, tax uh, 
tax uh, or, or increasing government revenue is is the big challenge and and it looks like sanat uh, also from your interactions with these revenue agencies do you realize that there is a permanent capacity issue you know versus the goal you know it doesn't seem like our infrastructure is ready for that uh, if you see audit companies they have this audit trainee scheme likewise there are a lot of aspiring accountants so if you uh, hire them and go behind the people who are not paying taxes is worth right let's say you pay 50000 for these graduate trainees and uh, get into the revenue authorities and digitalize everything so then it's a matter of you know monitoring and even if you put 5000 people at 50000 just see how much of revenue they can collect they it will be 20 30 fold uh, revenue they can collect the issue is that tax net is not strong and we are not going behind the people who are not paying taxes there are so many proxies is people is not uh, an issue because i have heard that some government institutions are having uh, degree holders as excess employees when they want to give a job they give but whether they the job is giving the correct output so why don't you man this uh, inland revenue authority customs everywhere with lot of staff yeah they they can justify the cost why don't you collect your withholding taxes from the banks directly maybe even increase a little bit of withholding tax but make it a final tax right why are you having the manual file systems right it gives sense the wrong message that there is something more to it than just collecting the taxes why is it so bureaucratic why is it so unproductive and long winded shouldn't it be a simple uh, you know process where you just go online and pay your uh, uh, taxes yeah uh, as we wrap up i'll ask each of you to also tell us why you're hopeful and optimistic for sri lanka right i will start with you and 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 you can also add your closing thoughts to that i'll start with you jonathan and come this way uh, does are you in a hopeful place for the future of sri lanka why i am uh, and i have no interest in looking anywhere else other than you know sri lanka because i believe that you know uh, we have got a fantastic opportunity some people might say we are at the bottom we can't go any lowers we can only come up but i would say we continue to come to this crossroads right and we just need to take the right turn at this particular point do not expect more help from imf don't wait for further reschedulements further round table conversations make this count already there is a little bit of lethargy procrastination that can be seen you have a job assigned to you in this particular 10 year program pay a uh, play your role let the others play their role you play your role, uh, your role. i have got to play uh, mine if each one whether it's regulator whether it's government whether it's about soe divestment whether it's you know some of these sales whether it's small government and you know managing with the skills that you have and uh, uh, us a uh, helping looking at areas managing our foreign exchange driving tourism driving exports uh, you know helping our migrant workers starting businesses locally manufacturing entrepreneurship improve transparency governance make this a great attractive place for people not only to visit as tourists but to come and do business as well our boi should not be doing 1 2 billion a year look at the countries around who are doing 10 20 billion a year why not sri lanka this is probably as i have always said the most beautiful place in the world with the most beautiful people in the world then there can't be anything that should stop us from uh, uh, you know uh, uh, being positive and making sure everybody will help if we remain honest uh, to ourselves actually clive what gives you optimism i think uh, we have as a country we have come a long way from where we were and uh, i think uh, we have taken a lot of hard decisions see cost just take a example of electricity nobody thought that electricity prices could get increased this much so as a country i think uh, those hard decisions has been taken uh, we pull credit to the authorities for that i think it's a case of taking this forward so you should not uh, lose the momentum and i think uh, we are in a sort of a growth trajectory yeah 
to answer that question, I answered in your earlier program also. Are we having natural disasters? No. Are we having a talent shortage? No, we have very smart people, educated people. Even in universities, tertiary education, 1.4 times women are there. The inclusivity is there. Geographically, we are not a landlocked country. We are nicely placed in a very good geographical location where we can uh, aviation logistic handling. Uh, we don't have any political issues out with outside countries. We are neutral. And uh, we have tourism, we have beautiful weather. So what is missing is the that uh, the leadership and the policy consistency. It's a man-made disaster, as I mentioned in the earlier program. If we fix that, everything will get into place. But unfortunately, for the last 50, 60 years, it has not come in. We have a lot of lost opportunities where the multinationals came here and went back. We are big universities tried to put uh, their universities here, the big factories uh, where India got uh, advantage because we were not serious. So always the leadership and willingness to contribute to the country, if that is there, five years is enough for us to turn back. Sanat, Clive, Jonathan, this has been a wonderful conversation. I thank you for being so candid uh, and open about our challenges across the economy, the need for leadership, and also, you know, how banking can be a bigger contributor to economic growth. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you, Charlie. Thank, thank, thank you for having us. Thank you.